Greetings, and welcome to the Southwest Church of Christ. We are located at 380 Franklin Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut. My name is Brother Melvin Jones, and I am the Ministering Evangelist. We would like to thank you for tuning in to our YouTube channel, where the Word of God is preached in its simplicity. So we pray that you will be drawn closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through these messages on our YouTube channel. May God bless you. Everything you need to know about life yes. in all of its abundance, you are in the right place in the Church of Christ, yes. where we worship in spirit and in truth. Yes. And it's a blessing to be in the presence of greatness today. Yes. Fellas, just turn me down just a touch to get rid of that little bit of echo, that reverb that we had. Just turn me down just a little bit. So good to see everybody with us today. So good to see our visitors, our guests. Uh, we have some that are traveling. It's Labor Day weekend, and uh, let's keep the Coley's in prayer. They took Mark to school this morning. And so let's keep that family, that household in prayer, and dynamics change when people leave the house. And, and so uh, it's just amazing watching these kids grow up, and next thing you know, they're going to college. And so I'll tell you what, they are in the right place to get the right foundation. They are going to need this when they get out there in that world. At least they know, whether or not they apply it or not, they know right from wrong. And so we pray that they will use these tools that they've learned. That's why I say family, parents, bring your kids to Sunday school. Bring them to class. Bring them here so they can learn what they need to learn. And then reinforce it in your homes and have that Christian home so they'll know what that looks like. And so they'll know what to expect when they become adults. In a basketball game, when a player commits a violation, the referee will blow the whistle. And all of the action on the court abruptly stops when the whistle is blown. The referee then points to the offender. And the referee shouts, travel, double dribble, foul, whatever the case may be. Rules, fouls, and penalties are part of the game and are regulated to enforce uh, the game. They are regulated by the referees and the judges and the officials. Every participant on the floor knows the rules. They know the boundaries. They know that behaviors are monitored on the court. If not, it will be complete chaos on the court. Well, there are laws in life, boundaries established by God. And sometimes you and I, we violate those rules and God has to blow his spiritual whistle. <laughs> Unlike basketball, after so many violations, depending on the nature of the violation, you could be ejected from the game. Right. Or the coach will just eject you from the game and sit you on the bench. But with God, ah, oh, his grace is so good. With God, when we violate his ordinances, violates his laws, his precepts, he blows the whistle via his word. See, God does not blow the whistle to kick us out of the game. He blows the whistle to give us grace so we can stay in the game. So we can know how to operate correctly in this game we call life. And God gives us chance after chance after chance to get it right so we can stay in the game. But church, I dropped by to tell you this morning that somebody didn't wake up this morning. And they are now out of the game. God has blown the whistle in their lives several times. And I pray that they have taken heed to his warning. So in a basketball game, statisticians, statisticians, the people that keep the stats. <laughs> they keep record of all of your violations. But God, because of his grace, does not keep record of our violations. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute his sin. Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Impute means keep a count, keeping a record. Like we do, when somebody do us wrong, we keep an account. 
I remember what you did to me back in 1965. Amen. Oh, Lord, some of y'all my fault. Let me look at my... <laughs> Not me <either. laughs> but, but, but sometimes we keep track of what folk have done. But God doesn't do that. Thank God for his grace. That he does not keep record. Oh, I thank God he don't keep record of the stuff that I have done. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, Amen. for not keeping record Amen. of the stuff Brother Jones have done. And all the stuff Melvin Jones, that was B.C. before Brother Jones. <laughs> all I want to say this morning, y'all, is that God is good. Amen. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. Yeah. God is good. The text that was read for your hearing this morning, the book of Nahum. Nahum is known as a minor prophet. The Lord knows he has a major message. He's a minor prophet. doesn't mean that his words are less significant than Jeremiah, Isaiah, and some of the major prophets. It's just that his message is a little shorter than theirs. The book bears the name of the prophet, which means comfort and consolation. The name of Nahum, Comfort, is a strange name for this book because the book of Nahum is a book of judgment. It is a book of harsh pronouncement and doom against the people who have abandoned the ways of God. When the book of Nahum was written, the Assyrian Empire was at the height of its military and national power. They were on the march, seeking to expand their borders, and the nation of Israel happened to be in their path of destruction. God used them to punish Israel for their sins, but God would also punish Assyria for their disobedience and for their harsh treatment of God's people. So while Nahum's message is one of judgment and wrath, there is a bright spot in this text. And in the midst of all this wrath and all this doom and all this pronouncement of judgment, there is a bright spot that stands out like a shining star, a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. Church, we live in a world full of darkness and storms and gloomy nights, and we need a bright spot in our lives. Amen? So I want verse 7 to be the emphasis of our message this morning when he said, the Lord is good. So as we go through these few verses, and Lord have mercy, there's so much in it, I'm not going to be able to deal with everything in it, but I'm going to give you what the Spirit gave me. Uh, we want to park at verse 7. That's where, that's where our thought is going to come from. But for right now, let's look at verse 1 and 2 of Nahum chapter number 1. Nahum chapter number 1 and verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Alkashat. God is jealous. And the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Notice the Bible says that God is a jealous God. When you think about somebody that you care for, somebody that is dear to your heart, and then someone comes along and disrupts that relationship, with the one you care about. Sometimes we can have a tendency to be jealous. <laughs> we can be jealous of those relationships. It happens uh, with husbands, with wives, with co-workers, with family members, brothers, sisters, teammates, church members. Saul became jealous of David. Remember uh, uh, Penina, she was je jealous of Elkanah. She was jealous, I'm sorry, she was jealous of Hannah, Elkanah's wife. Although Peninnah had kids, Hannah, she didn't have no kids. She couldn't have kids. She was barren. But yet this woman that had all these kids was jealous of the woman that didn't have any kids. Ahab was jealous of Naboth's vineyard. The Bible says that Naboth the king, that, that, that Ahab the king had a better vineyard than Naboth. But yet he was still jealous. That's like you driving around in a Bentley and you jealous of your neighbor because they got a Volkswagen. Cain was jealous of Abel. Reuben and his brothers jealous of Joseph. And the list goes on and on. And sometimes this jealousy can lead to envy and sometimes strife. Sometimes vengeance. Most of the time, jealousy is a product of selfishness. 
It's what I want. Well, I want what you have. Now, jealousy may be a surprising term associated with God. God is not tainted with the negative connotation of the verb. Amen, somebody. His holiness does not tolerate competitors or those that sin against him. It is appropriate for God to insist in our complete alliance to him. I said it is appropriate for him to insist that we have a complete alliance with God and him and him only. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 real quick. Let's take a look at something. Romans chapter 8. Because see, his jealousy and vengeance is not mixed with selfishness and strife. See, our jealousy, we, we all, man, we take that thing to a whole other level. We will throw folk under the bus, put the bus in drive, then put the bus in reverse, then put it back in drive, then put it back in reverse. To run over that person we jealous of over and over again. So yes, God does get jealous when we let something or someone come between us and him. And church, I need to tell you that God is good because he wants us to have an alliance with him. He wants us to stand before him. Now, my understanding of this comes much clearer in Romans chapter 8. Drop down to verse 38. Romans 8 and 38. Brother Bristol, what is the Bible trying to tell us there? For I am convinced. I am convinced. That neither death. Now, hold on a second. Whether the death penalty threatens my life. I am persuaded, I am convinced that neither death or what else? No life. Or what else? No angels. Now wait a minute. No angels. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says if an angel or somebody else preach another gospel, let him be a curse. I don't care if life, death, an angel, or what else? No principalities. No principalities. No things present. Listen, I don't care if this government, they can say all that they want, I'm going to follow Jesus. Principality, powers. I, I am convinced. I am persuaded. Read on. No things to come, no power. Listen, I don't care what's happening right now in my life. I don't care what's going to happen in my life. Read on. No heights. No heights. No depth. No depths. No any other created thing. Anything created, read on. Shall be able. Shall be able. To separate. To what? To separate. To what? To separate. To separate me from what? From the love of from God. From the love of God. Nothing. I'm persuaded. Are you persuaded this morning? Are you convinced this morning that nothing is going to separate you from the love of God? See, the devil is in the separating business. God is in the bringing together business. What is it that separates us from God? It's sin. It always separates us from God. Now listen, I know that we can't live a sinless life. But we all need to sin less in life. My God is too good for me to let activities cause me to be absent from his service. God is too good for me to let my family and my feelings allow me to forsake the assembly. God is too good for me to let technology tear me away from God. Yeah, for those of you that are living locally that decided to have church on your device, but you know you could have been here. Amen. This is for the sick and shut in and those that are far off. Yes, sir. I'm not going to let technology tear me away from the assembly. Amen. God is too good for me to, uh, uh, to be selfish and to separate me from the Savior. God is too good for me to allow my personal agenda to prevent me from partaking in the service of the Lord. God is just too good to me to let my stuff stop me from serving. Amen. Just been too good to me. I, I just can't let anything separate me from this. Yes. Amen. Amen. God is good. And you don't mistreat folk that's good to you. When you forsake God, we mistreat him. Folk that go all out their way for you, you'll be, go all out your way to be good to them. Amen. Go out your way to be good for God. Amen. Good to God. Amen. Look at verse 3 of the text. The Lord is slow to anger. 
and great in power. It will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds of the dust of his feet. I'm so grateful to God that he, his wrath is slow. I'm so glad that God is slow to anger. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> there's some things that ignite my anger. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to be on the shadow of a doubt that if God get as angry as I get, as I get angry, oh, Lord, I would have been destroyed a long time ago. But you know, church, unfortunately, we live in an angry world. People just seem to be angry. Why are people living in this place? Church, turn your Bibles to James chapter 1. Let's, let's, let's let the Bible do the talking this morning. If you have a device, uh, preferably go to the NIV in this text. I love what the NIV has to say about this in James chapter 1. Now, I understand that we get angry from time to time. That's just an emotion that was given to us. We have that emotion. But there's angry, and then there's wall-punching angry. There's object-throwing angry. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's I'm always ready to fight angry. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's that cussing at the top of my lungs angry. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's that I said something in my anger that I wish I could take back kind of anger. Now the latter type of this tantrum, the latter type of this anger, if this is a reoccurring problem, this could be a symptom of a psychiatric condition currently known as the intermittent explosive Disorder, also known as IED. This is a psychiatric condition. Intermittent explosive disorder. But notice how this symptom is described as a disorder. See, that type of anger is a disorder because God didn't order it. As a matter of fact, Anything that God didn't order is a disorder. <laughs> in the mighty name of Jesus, it's a disorder. But some folk are just so quick to want to fight instead of solving the problem sensibly, reasonably, and lovingly. We need to glean from God and be slow to anger. After all, God was slow to anger when the nation of Israel kept complaining in the desert, but God just kept on blessing. God was slow to anger when Jeremiah preached for 50 years and didn't get one convert. God was slow to anger when Abraham, the father of faith, lied to Abimelech and said, man, this woman is my sister, not my wife. God was slow to anger when Peter denied his son three times. God was slow to anger when Saul persecuted the church. God was slow to anger when you and I were out there doing stuff we ain't had no business doing. God was slow to anger right now as he looks down on our lives of imperfection. God is slow to anger. That's why Brother James tells us in James chapter 1, drop down to verse number 19. Read what the Bible says, my brother. This you know, my beloved. Okay. Brethren, but let everyone be quick to hear. Okay, now listen. Everybody be what? Quick to hear and what? Slow to speak. Okay, hold on a second. Think about how God designed us. Quick to hear, slow to speak. God gave us two ears and one mouth. He knows what he's doing. Now what if God would have gave us two mouths and one ear? First of all, that would look kind of insane. <laughs> But well, see, some folk walk around like they got two mouths because they always got something to say. And one ear right here, they don't even listen. When you are listening, you learn. And you can hear things, two ears. I can hear stuff coming from all different angles. And when I speak, speak of the oracles of God. Say something that's pleasurable. Say something that's holy. Good things ought to proceed from our mouths. So my dear brothers, take note. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, right? And what else does he say? 
and slow to anger. Keep reading. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You see that? All this insane anger, this cussing, these tantrums, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Listen, being slow to anger is therapeutic. Think about that thought for a second. Every minute you remain angry, you give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. Being angry gives you no right to be cruel. Be sure to taste your words before you spit them out. Explain your anger instead of expressing your anger. Explain it. This is why I'm upset. Instead of expressing it and throwing stuff around. Explain yourself. And you'll find solutions instead of arguments. Somebody said, a man who has never made a woman angry is a failure in life. So fellas, I believe if that statement is true, we all successful. See, see, y'all sisters, y'all laughing too hard at that. Stop, stop. I know we've all upset a woman somewhere along our journey. And if you haven't, keep listening. But church, I got to say this again and again. God is so good. He is slow to get angry. When, when you tell somebody not to do something and they keep on doing it, what's going to happen? You're going to be ticked off to the highest of ticktivity. God keeps telling us to stop doing stuff. And we keep doing stuff. But yet, he's slow to God is good. The name says in that same verse that Lord, the Lord has a way in the whirlwind and in the storm and that the, the clouds are at his feet. That simply reminds us that God is in control. He is our sovereign God. And, 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 and listen, the winds and the waves obey his will. When the storms of life rise against you and the winds of adversity are buffeting uh, your life, you will discover that there is a place of refuge for the child of God. You will discover that there's a place of peace in the midst of your storm. You will discover that God is directing your path for his glory. I said he's directing your path for his glory. Therefore, trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. Let me park right there for a second. It's something about this path that God has given us. The word path refers to an unmarked way of life. Job understood this truth. He didn't see it coming. It was an unmarked path for him to lose his family and his money all in one day. Yes. David understood this truth. Sometimes we just don't know which way the wind is going to blow. We don't know what's on our path. Amen. We don't know when there's going to be a storm. We don't know when it's going to be devastating weather conditions. But what we do know is that God is good. And if he laid out this path just for me, the outcome is going to be all right. God is in control when things, when things seem to be out of control. Have you ever had a, a, a situation in life where just things just seem to be out of control? I, I just don't know what to do with all this stuff. But always know God is in control. God can handle your stuff way better than you can. All we need to know is that God orders the steps of a good man. He's a lamp to my feet. Light to my path. I might not know what's on my path, but the good Lord, he knows my path. And we need to learn that truth, even when we cannot see the way. All we need to know is that he is the way. Always remember this, y'all. Always remember this. That we are on a path of change. Listen, I want, I want y'all to hear me good now. On this path of change, 
we must have what I call a path of recognition. Remember those two words, a path of recognition. I can learn from all of the different people that I meet on my path. We got to understand that. We got to recognize that when God is directing your path, he is directing your life. Therefore, the path of recognition, it says that I'm being molded on this path. See, we got to be on a path. We got to have a path of recognition. Recognize you're being molded on your path. The people that you meet, guess what? They're helping to shape and form you. Some are going to mistreat you, but guess what? I can learn from that. Some people are going to treat me good. I can learn from that. When I am mistreated by some of the people on this path, I'll learn how to deal with the shady people of this world in a holy way. Because folk will throw some shade. I can learn from the hardships on this path of life. These hardships, they build me up. And, and I can use my trouble as a teachable moment when I meet others on my path. You got to recognize the trouble on your path and glean from your trouble. It's a path of change, and we got to have a path of recognition. So while I'm being molded on my path, now listen, while I'm being molded on this path, I got to keep on moving. Amen. So I'm being molded, but yet I got to keep moving. When I run into an obstacle on my path, I don't stop right there. I pray and I work my way through this thing so I can keep moving. God doesn't expect us to stop right there. Through his power, through the spirit, I can keep moving. So I'm being molded and I got to move. No matter how hard life gets, I got to move forward. Amen. Press on Amen. and reach the prize yes. of the goal that's in Christ Jesus. David had many obstacles in his path, but he had a path of recognition and he kept obeying God. Lost his child. His son wanted to destroy him. I know all the stuff David went through. Saul had a hit out on his life. But yet, he recognized his path. And he obeyed God. The apostle Paul. Many obstacles on his path. But Paul had the path of recognition. He obeyed God. 39 times he received stripes. Three times beaten with rods. He, with rods. he was stoned. He was shipwrecked. Left for dead. A lot of us would have stopped at the first whip. He got whipped five with 39 lashes on five different occasions. After the first one, man, we'd have been, whoa, hold on a second. But he had a path of recognition. He knew that nothing could separate him from the love of God. So we must recognize that we are being molded and we got to keep moving. Now, also on this path, we must recognize that our path is personal. And it's purposeful. The path is personal. And it's purposeful. God is so good that he designed a tailor-made path just for you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and y'all over there. It's a personal tailor-made path just for you. Your path ain't mine, and mine ain't yours. You want to deal with some stuff on your path that I ain't going to have to deal with. I'm going to deal with some stuff that you ain't going to have to deal with. It's personal. And don't look at somebody else's path and, and, and get jealous or stop feeling some kind of way because their path seem a little easier than yours. That's just their path. Mine was designed for me to have more hardships, perhaps. But that's your path. Stay on your path. Stay focused on your path because it's personal. And because your path is personal, it's tailor-made just for your purpose. Amen. Your purpose ain't my purpose. My purpose is not your purpose. God is preparing you to fit in his kingdom where he desires. Your path is your training ground so he can prepare you for better works. So just deal with the training. Anybody ever worked with a personal trainer before and they just like, come on, give me five more. You can keep going. Man, are you out of your mind? I'm tired. <laughs> but the trainer say, keep on going. God is saying, yes, I know you. Lord, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. But God said, keep on going. Amen. Keep on going. Yes. He's your personal trainer to get you ready for your purpose. Amen. 
We have a personal trainer. Why? My purpose is to lose weight and get rid of some of the fat to feel good. God is setting you up so you can have a, a good, solid place in his kingdom. When you have the path of recognition, you will embrace your path. Live your path. And thank God for your path. And you will have a clearer understanding that God is molding you and moving you and changing you so you can step into your purpose with passion and power. Amen. He don't want you to come to him no other way. He wants you to come to him with passion and power. Amen. And he's setting you up for that on your path. The Bible tells us in Psalms 139 and, and, and number one, the Bible says, uh, the, the writer there says, oh, oh, search me, oh God. He is watching how we operate on our path. When someone close to you has done something bad to you, God is searching you. He's checking you out, seeing how you're going to handle that. When it, when it is easy to blame someone for what you should be taking the blame for, God is searching. He's trying to see how you're going to deal with this thing. When money is tight, God is searching. When you are frustrated, when you are tired, when you are angry, God is searching you. Search me, O oh Lord. Through and through. Do a complete inventory. Let me know where my weaknesses are. Because I want to be all that I could be for your kingdom. So, so recognize this on your path. It's a path that's personal. It is purposeful. You're moving. You're being molded. So make sure, church, as you go through your life, it's a path of recognition. When things happen in your daily life, when things happen to you, stop thinking and recognize what's going on. It'll help you deal with your stuff a lot better, no matter how tragic it is. This is a personal path, but it's designed for you to step into your purpose. Let's move on, verse number four of the text. He rebukes the sea and make it dry and dry up all the rivers. Bashan languishes and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. Nahum just continues to describe the power of God. He says, God dries up the sea. Man, that's a lot of power. And it's, it's tough for us to fathom that thought, seeing that this world is made up of mostly water. But God is all power. He says, Bashan and Carmel withers. Why does Nahum use these geographical places on God's earth to describe God's power? Well, Bashan, now think about it. He says, Bashan. And Carmel withers. We've seen what plant life looks like when it withers. Bashan was about a thousand square miles. And it was known to have one of the largest forests filled with beautiful oak trees. But it withers before God. Well, Brother Nahum, why did you mention Carmel in this text? Well, Mount Carmel was about 13 miles long. And it dipped right into the Mediterranean Sea. And it was about 1,600 feet above sea level. And, and, and Nahum, he makes mention of, of Lebanon. And he makes mention of the blossoms. See, in Lebanon, they had all of these beautiful smelling flowers all over Lebanon. And so when you think about Bashan, when you think about Mount Carmel and all of the fruit trees that was up there, when you think about Lebanon and all of the fruits and the Aramaic shrubs and the vines, and the Bible says that all oh, withers before God. That's how powerful he is. The line of cultivation, 6,000 feet. That's a lot of land, y'all. These mountains are emblems of richness and lasting beauty and fruit, fruitfulness and, 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 and loftiness. And there is nothing in the world so blooming that God can make change it when he says so. You know, somebody said once, well, why doesn't God just get rid of all of the evil? Why doesn't God just say, boom, and all of the evil is gone? And my answer to that is, that's because God is good. Because if he got rid of all of the evil right now, many of us will be gone right now. Amen. Think about that. You better be glad. And the folk that say that, not even in Christ. You better be glad 
He don't just get rid of all evil. See, that's because we categorize evil. We look at all of the big stuff, we call it the big sins. But the stuff that we do every day, God looks at it all as being immoral. Okay, so verse 5 and 6 as we get ready to come to a land. So the mountains quake at him, the hills melt, and the earth is burnt at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwells therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Church, we stand in the presence of an awesome God, in complete control of nature, as previously stated. Listen, if he can have complete control over nature, he certainly can have complete control over our problem. Amen, somebody. If he can say, peace, be still to the sea, he can say, peace, be still to your problem. If he can uh, cover fleece with the morning dew, and yet the outside remains dry, Everything has due on it except the remaining. I remember the book of Gideon. Gideon says, Lord, if you really for me, in the nighttime, just put dew on the fleece and let everything else be dry. He woke up the next morning. Now y'all know morning dew is everywhere. But morning dew is just on the fleece and nowhere else. He was like, Lord, I see you loud and clear, but I'm not quite convinced. The next morning, put dew all over the place except the fleece. So enough when he woke up the next morning, there was morning dew all over the place except the fleece. I thought about to tell you that if he can cover the fleece with morning dew, but yet its surroundings remain dry, then he can cover me with his grace when all I want to do is cry. Yeah. Cover me with his grace. Yeah. If he can open the Red Sea so his children can walk on by, then he can open my mind and give me the strength and the resolve to fight on so I can keep on living. Amen. If he can lie down, sleep at the bottom of a boat while it's raining and thundering and lightning in the waves and Jesus down there knocked out <laughs> in a storm, then when I'm going through my storm, wow. when the waves is beating up on my life, wow. then I can lie down on sheets of satisfaction. Yeah. I can lie down on cushions of comfort. I can lie down on a pillow of peace, just like Jesus in the midst of a storm. If three boys can withstand the heat of a fiery furnace, so no, I can withstand the fiery darts of Satan. Church, my God is good. And, and, and I'm telling you, my God is gooder than good. As a matter of fact, I don't even know no other words that can describe his goodness. So all we can say is God is good. So finally this morning, finally this morning, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust him. He knows us. That means he knows us intimately. And we need to know him experientially. We need to experience God. The word trust means to flee for protection and trust in God. The phrase reminds us, though, that God knows his people. He knows those who are his. He knows our names, our date of birth. He knows all the hair on our head. Keep going, man. That's too easy. Uh, <laughs> he knows us intimately, comprehensively, and completely. There is nothing about you, your life, your situation that God does not know he knows you and he loves you. I think he don't leave you hanging in all that stuff you're dealing with. It's not the kind of God we serve. We are his friends. You know, somebody said, you are known by the company you keep. Amen. Sounds to me that the Lord's people are in good company. Amen, Amen y'all. He has saved us by his grace and brought us into his family. And we have a heavenly acquaintance that gives us hope in the day of trouble. So I just want to remind you, as I close, God is good. You know, this might be a good time to come to him and be a partaker of his goodness. Somebody may have wandered away. This is a good time to come on back home. Stand before God. If you've been doubting his goodness, if you've been going through something and you've said to yourself, where is God? This is a good time to rededicate and repent. And say, Lord, all right, I, I doubted your power. I, 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 had, I, I didn't trust you, Lord. And I tried to do this on my own, or you took too long, and my situations are getting worse. Where are you, Lord? Sometimes, church, we lose faith. 
And we need to say, Lord, you know what? I, I recognize. I'm on this path of recognition. I recognize that if you set this before me, you could get me through this. Yeah. I end with this story. I told this before. I love this story, though. There was a little boy who was watching his grandmother bake a cake. And uh, this little boy that was telling his grandmother how everything in life was going wrong. He was a teenager and he was dealing with a lot in his life. And he was saying, things just ain't right. I'm being bullied. My grades ain't right. I have no friends. Girls don't like me. Didn't make the basketball team. And so he told his grandmother about his problems in school with his family and his friends. Meanwhile, while his grandmother was baking the cake, she asked the grandson if he would like, like a snack. And he said, sure, Grandma, I would like a snack. And so his grandmother said, here's some cooking oil. Here, drink this. Little boy said, ew, Grandma. He said, yuck. She said, all right, here's a couple of raw eggs. Eat this, boy. He said, no, Grandma, I don't want to eat those eggs. They're raw. Can you scramble them up? <laughs> That's gross. She said, all right, here, take some flour, mix it with some baking soda and eat that. You'll be all right. Grandma says, he says to Grandma, no, no, no. All that stuff is yucky. And then the grandma says, yes, all these things seem bad by themselves. But when they're all put together the right way, they make a wonderful and delicious cake. God works the same way. Many times we wonder why we can let us go through so much and so many difficulties in life. But when we trust in him and he put it all together, it's going to make a son a child of God. And his word is Good. Come on, soul. God is good. God is good. Yes. Brother, come with all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I don't know what you're experiencing today. But I want you to leave with a final thought. God is good. Amen. That's all you need to know. And all things work out for what? Good. Thank you, Nahum, for reminding us about how good God is. God took the nation of Israel on a journey. They had to have path recognition. And on that path while they were in captivity, they recognized what they did wrong. And now they recognize what they're going through. And then God comes through like a superhero and saves the day. Now, if you're here today and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you need to be. Because God has been so good to you that he's given you a chance to hear his word. But all he wants you to do is come by faith and respond to his word. I mean, it, it's a step of faith. That's all it is. So you heard his word. You've got to believe his word. And be willing to change your life around. Don't look at your life as you've given up something. Look at you as gaining something. So many people don't want to come to church because they feel like, oh, I got to give up this, I got to give up that. Look at what you're gaining. Amen. And what you're gaining is much more beneficial for your spiritual development than what you're losing. So repent and confess the sweetest name ever mentioned in this world. And that's Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're a member of the Church of Christ and, and you've just been trying to solve your own problems, do things your way, if you felt that you have come short in any kind of way, come back to Jesus. Today, and be renewed, rebuilt, and restored. This is a day of renewal, y'all. It's a day of renewal. Every day is a day of renewal. But that's one thing I love about Sunday morning. We can get our business straight with God. You can do that in your closet as well. But it's something about that corporate worship that brings us together. And we can edify each other in song and uplift each other. And hear each other's testimonies. Hear each other's difficulties. Pray together and love each other unconditionally. Continue to have an environment and an energy of love. And continue to have a no judgment zone in the body of Christ. So we can all go on this journey together. On this path together. As we continue to follow the words of Christ. God is Good. Let us all stand and let us have a closing song. We want to thank you so very much for tuning in today. We pray that something was said in this message that will cause you to make alterations in your life, that will cause you to think things through and have a different perspective. For the word of God is power. The word of God is truth. Please tune in again next week as we continue to preach God's word. And we just pray that lives are touched and souls are saved. Thank you very much. And may God bless you all.